Letter from a Nomad I am living in Big Tahunga Canyon. Bright sunlight and fresh air stream into my home. A hundred yards away rushes the creek. Beyond rise rugged hills, green with winter grass and budding shrubs. A few more days I will live here, riding, installing some equipment, then move to Los Angeles for a short, intense contract job. Next summer, when Tahunga Canyon is no longer very green, and Los Angeles may be hot in more ways than one, I will be living somewhere in Canada. My home is a house car. I chose this way to freedom because it offers me the best of two worlds. I can live most of the time away from regimented, congested, indefensible cities, yet still profit by exporting my labor into these cities. I have the freedom and security offered by mobility, yet I possess what is in most respects a permanent residence. I can fully enjoy my life right now, yet live economically, and accumulate capital for further ventures. Finally, I can opt out alone. While I look forward to trade with others who may choose similar or complementary ways of life, my liberty does not depend on their decisions. I am also delighted with unforeseen fringe benefits, ease of washing or resting after a journey, no worry about what to take with me, no time spent idle waiting for something or someone, no commuting to work. All travel is more efficient. I move only from destination to destination without intervening trips to a stationary home. Far from having a primitive way of life, I enjoy electric lights, running hot and cold water, shower, gas range, and heater. And all are self-contained, not dependent on external utility connections. With occasional refills of water, gasoline, and propane, I can enjoy my modern conveniences anywhere a rugged truck will take me. At first I was crowded especially when my rolling voluntary society doubled in population. But after consigning seldom used items to storage, adding under chassis compartments, and carefully rearranging, the interior is neat, belongings are accessible, and space is adequate for two people. Like many other self-liberating activities, mobile living is safest in the largest city or wildest wilderness. Cops have bothered me only twice in four months of living abroad. Both times were in farming areas where, while traveling, I had stopped on unposted private lands, Patrolling deputies asked me to move on. I have no problem parking on city streets at night, usually in apartment residential areas. On jobs, I often stay in the company parking lot. Only rarely have I rented space in the backyards of friends when doing work which immobilizes the truck for several days. This way of life is very economical. My almost new house car, including much gear I have added, has cost under $6,000, a fraction of the price of a comparable yacht, or a well-equipped retreat home, not to mention a cracker box in the suburbs. In living expenses for two total about $120 per month, including $55 for food, $20 for gasoline, $10 for maintenance, $10 rental for storage space, and $25 for miscellaneous. So far, I have been too busy to travel extensively or to seek out especially attractive campsites. But already, I have lived many exquisite days and evenings at beaches, mountains, and forests. I am still learning the ways of a modern nomad. But already, I am free. From Innovator, March 1968. You're listening to the Vanu Podcast. The podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation. Old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to vanupodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, the website is pasnia.com. Uh, today I'm back with my final guaranteed show with you here on Coast to Coast AM, uh, the final installment of this short mini-series I've entitled Coast to Coast Liberation. Uh, in the first episode, I introduced you to the subjects of Vanu and self-liberation more generally, and why liberation from the first realm, uh, the Servile Society, is so necessary, as if 2020 didn't provide enough glaring examples. In the second installment, you caught some of the audiobook of the must-read uh, Second Realm book on strategy by Smuggler uh, and XYZ. And last week, I shared the most recent episode of the podcast on pursuing Vanu and cities with my pseudonymous guest, Omen. And today, I will release what I'm calling the Liberated Lifestyle Chronicles, Reports and letters from self-liberators ranging from the 1960s up until well, even last year. It should inspire as well as further demonstrate the efficacy 
uh, and the freeing nature of these radical Vanu lifestyle changes. But first, please do check out what we're doing here at the Free Republic of Pasnia. Um, in short, I declared my uh, homestead to be an independent country, and over the past year, we've been making steps towards the founding of an, of an intentional community and uh, overarching Second Realm network. And uh, yeah, this year we've been focused on food self-sufficiency and beginning the formation of the network. Uh, you know, lots of trying trying to connect with. Uh, uh, can I, I guess you could call it diplomatic relations, Pasnia diplomatic relations. Uh, and yeah, yeah, next year we'll, we'll uh, take additional steps towards going off grid, uh, likely in the realm of water and energy. But uh, yeah, all that's uh, everything's transitionary right now. Um, but yeah, our website, Pasnia.com, goes through all of this in great detail. Uh, you can also check out videos of events held here last year, the uh, Pasnia Rebirth of Freedom Ceremony. Uh, links to join the Pasnia Committee of Correspondence Telegram channel. Uh, you can read and sign our Declaration of Independence, uh, Constitution. Uh, we won't accept any social contract nonsense here, so uh, you got to explicitly sign. Um, of course, you can do it as a pseudonym, but, uh, and we encourage that. But, uh, mu and, and much, much more. Uh, again, just visit Pasnia.com to become a stakeholder uh, or to learn more. And again, if any of this terminology is new to you, please visit vanupodcast.com and uh, start digging in. Uh, our full episode archives is laid out in the episodes tab, or you can start reading uh, and listening to any of the books or zines we've digitized there at the free books tab. Uh, you can also just search for the Vanu Podcast uh, on your favorite podcatcher. Uh, anyway, let's uh, get on with it. Here are the Liberated Lifestyle Chronicles. The Spirit of Laissez-Faire, Avani Resistance Report. One evening in February this winter, I leapt ashore after our oil tanker docked in Providence, Rhode Island, ran to the payphone, called Seafair Yachts in Huntington, Long Island, and ordered a Seafair 26-foot sailboat, sailboat hole. That phone call was the climax of my winter's work and planning in the beginning of Laissez-Faire. I continued sailing on Atlantic tankers till April 20th, when I took a long-awaited six-week vacation. The hole was delivered to my backyard on the 26th of April. That was the day I had lived for all winter. While standing watches with frozen feet, blasted by the Atlantic's winter gales, through the seemingly endless days of scraping and painting, through six months of straining to hold my mind back to the routine of shipboard life, that was the vision which made it possible for me. I went to work with a will. What a joy it was to be working for myself to be directly responsible for all aspects of the project. Bulkheads and deck beams were fitted and glassed in. 2,500 pounds of lead was poured in nine sections for inside ballast. Plywood decks were bolted, glassed, glued, nailed, and screwed to the frames. The cabin trunk went on and cabin top beams were fitted. The mass partners of two and a quarter inch white oak were bolted in with four 21 inch bolts. A living larch tree was selected and cut for a mast. By the time I had completed that much of her, it was time to return to work on Atlantic tankers again, and that's where I am now. I'll work till the middle of August, quit the job, and return home to finish her. I hope to depart for Florida via the Intracoastal Waterway no later than November. After that, the world. So far, the costs have added up this way. $1,150 for the bare fiberglass hole, approximately $700 for options and transportation to my home, and about $900 for materials so far. I hope to finish her, equip her, provision her, and launch her for another $1,500. I'm building and rigging her with single-handed sailing and living in mind. The rig will be a 250-square-foot Hong Kong junk-style mainsail. The mast will stand with no side stays and one forestay, on which various jibs can be set to balance the large mainsail. She will have a wind vane self-steering setup. I plan to lead all running rigging to cleats near main hatch, so in rough weather I can sail her from inside the cabin with just my head up through the hatch, which will be protected by a dodger. The interior shall have one bunk with floor space for visitors, a large desk chart table with a comfortable sea, a head and a galley, and lots of stowage space. All the area forward of the mast will be used for stowage, as will the space beneath the cockpit. This project has had many advantages and favorable side effects for me. Ever since I quit college last summer and decided to undertake it, I have the experience of living and working for a purpose. This was new to me. I like it very much. I cannot conceive of ever living without a purpose and goals in the future. Before this, I had read all of Ayn Rand and much general libertarianism with great enthusiasm. But now that I've got a purposeful direction in my own life, I see all these ideas in a new light. That of living them 
not just liking them. That, to me, is an invaluable improvement. I have found an area where I have an extreme degree of affinity with reality. What more can be said? I decided to name her the laissez-faire many months ago when I decided on a life of the same nature. This is what I see small boat living as making eminently possible. All of a snug home capable of easy, economical mobility, a readout, a fairly self-sufficient home base from which I can view and visit the world of men as briefly or as intimately as I wish. I can partake of all that coastal civilization has to offer, and when it becomes too little or the price too high, I can hoist my sails and search for the new and better. I will support myself with intermittent work and by my own writing and painting. What I feel now is the joy of impending freedom with no barriers, no limits, with my life in my own hands, and my success coming from my own sight, and thought, and action. David C. Englehart Old Mining Towns and Liberation in the Mountains from Vanu Life Number 1, May 1971. Begin letter. Friends, we've really enjoyed all received issues of PI, Preform Inform. First actual manifest key of hope, reality that's come along in, well, too long a time, since we're on the road. It's been about two years. For six years previous to coming here, Neil lived pretty much nomadically, and or as divorced from outside society, reality as was practical rarely living in any place for longer than a few months. Since we hailed from the east, most of that traveling was in and around New England, but also back and forth to Canada, South America, and points west. Met Lorraine in Vermont, where we led a conventional existence for six months to get some money together. Split for California. Bought an old plumber's truck for $275. Built on a camper and took off. After nine months, ended up in Idaho, really dug it, and because Lorraine stabilized. Had no money, but found this old mining village with many good people and managed to rent a home. An old miner's boarding house, huge and empty, like a dormitory. On credit, until we could find a way to bring in some income, which was not to be for about two months. Thanks to a lot of wild foods and a lot of dry food laid in California, we made it quite well. Having a kid didn't change much. Everybody helped, gave us diapers, etc., like it here so much, country so beautiful, mountains, weather out of sight except long winters, we didn't know then. When a house in our little town came available, we took it, super cheap. So that ended our nomadism for a while. Living out here, 12 miles from town, quiet, no hassles. We really dug it. Found that by working just a little, we could go for a few months at a time without working, and could just dig on the countryside, etc. Since we were really into good food, we got into ordering food for people and friends and neighbors. Here you can see it coming. We really blew it. A friend, we didn't know him then, he got out of jail. He had a lot of bread and wanted to do something with it. He thought a health food store would be good for the area. He didn't know we were really into it, so we volunteered. He put up the money. We got into it, but just to start off, you know. That was a year ago. We got it together and think that by the end of summer, it'll take care of itself and we can drop out and let things happen from there. What we should have done, and are also beginning now to do, with those same friends and neighbors, was to start a direct charge cooperative. This works. Get items needed at wholesale, food, gas, clothes, whatever. Sell to members at wholesale, plus shipping and or transportation charges, if any. And if there are any other expenses, these are levied, per month, week, whatever, evenly, per member. Thus enabling all to get things necessary for living, much more economically, and with as little hassle with capitalist retailers as is possible. Sun Valley is a super tourist area. Local merchants take great advantage of that at the expense of the local populace. Anyway, soon we'll be able to live in the mountains around here. We'd like to go for as long as possible. Friends have laid a horse on us, and we have a goat. Goats make fantastic pack animals in mountains, can go anywhere, and will carry Kyler and give milk. We'll also breed with mountain goats. Might be a real good thing. We have friends who live three and a half miles from here in two sheep camps. Have to ski in. It's a good trip. Also, many people live in, some abandoned, some not, cabins, trailers, etc., which are accessible only by skiing in. However, when the snow goes, so does your privacy and easiest mode of transport. But when snow goes, you can move back into mountains. Usual season for mountain travel, late June or July through September and October. This winter was long and heavy, but last year was okay. Entirely possible to live all summer in mountains away from anybody. 
There are quite a few who spend weeks and months doing so, and occasionally run into each other. Mountains are pretty rugged, though, and running into usual run-of-the-mill camper tourists is pretty rare. Except for the occasional helicopter-dropped camp, you can't win at all. So if we stay here, and we'd like to be here for a year, living free of all society's encumbrances, give up our house, etc., we'll probably do something like that. In summer, the fishing is great. We're presently making all our unpacking gear, etc. We didn't have anything when we came, and are hoping and planning to spend quite a bit of time away from it all. We've often thought of living around southwest Oregon, Cape Junction, but somehow we never made it over there. What's it like? Peace. Neil, Lorraine, and Kyler. Near Sun Valley, Idaho. Vaughnie Resistance Report Number 1. Alexandria from Australia. Part 1 of 2. A Self-Liberator's Life at Sea. During the late 80s, I worked as a secretary for the Westpac Bank, and my boyfriend Peter was a part owner of a small business. He used to work in a bank, too. We became friends with a local boat builder, Greg, during that time. Greg owned a boatyard in Redland Bay, Queensland, and he shared his love of boats with us. He inspired us to try our hands at sailing and perhaps ocean cruising. Greg lent us a 16-foot skiff for the day, and we loved it. The peace, freedom, beauty, tranquility, nature, and the ocean, and all its unpredictability. So we decided then and there to quit our jobs, sell almost everything we owned, and buy a yacht to live aboard and be free. We were feeling very stifled in our jobs and needed change. It was relatively easy to find a boat set up for cruising within our low price range. About one month later, we bought Kalu, named by the previous owner after the God of Thunder. Kalu was a 34-foot steel sloop with six berths, galley, wheelhouse, aft cabin, shower, toilet, a small library of boating books, and equipped for cruising. A few minor repairs were carried out by Greg, and we updated some equipment. Our plan? Live aboard Kalu, sail to Cape York, have a great time, be partially self-sufficient, and pick up a few odd jobs if we needed more cash. As complete novices, we joined a nearby yacht club, who were very welcoming to newbies. A few of the members were very happy to come aboard and give us sailing lessons. We completed a navigation course, radio course, and first aid. And we practiced man overboard. We spent time checking equipment over and how to use it. We researched, studied, and learned so much. It was not long before we felt ready enough to take on the challenge of leaving the port of Brisbane for good. Our favorite song was Sitting on the Dock of the Bay. We made necessary preparations and set our departure date. We stocked our galley with bulk pantry supplies and filled the fridge with plenty of fresh food. We left sugar and the television set behind. As our friends waved us goodbye from the jetty, I felt a mix of emotions, excitement, joy, sadness of leaving family and friends behind, and fear of the unknown. I reassured myself and remembered what I did have was courage, determination, a very real sense of adventure, and a willingness to learn. It was evident that my schooling was a huge setback to my practical skills, and I really felt this at times. But I pushed myself, and I sure wasn't going back to that bank job. My own programming from religious schooling and college had begun, and Peter was in his element. Some years later, he qualified to be a skipper for the charter boat industry in the Whit Sundays. The east coast of Australia is simply stunning. Some of my favorite anchorages were Lady Musgrave Island, Percy Island, Whit Sunday Islands, Lizard Islands, Cooktown, and the Lockhart River, to name a few. Never before had I seen whales, fish, migratory birds, wildlife, and clear starry night skies such as these. To be able to see the bottom of the sea at Anchorage on a full moon was spectacular, or the phosphorescence on a stormy night was so beautiful. And to have dolphins swimming at the bow of the boat and hearing them call was a treasure to behold. I felt so thankful and blessed that we are truly free to live in this beautiful paradise. Life was not always perfect. Things can and do go wrong no matter how much you plan. But with each challenge, we grew in knowledge, strength, and character. And at the end of each night, we shared a pot of tea and discussed the day under the stars. We took our time, sometimes staying in a safe anchorage for a day or up to a month. One such place was Hinchinbrook Island, just too beautiful to leave. We met so many awesome yachties, and we often got together to share stories, food, songs, laughter, and fun. Many happy hours were spent on the decks of other yachties, boats from all over the world. The choice was ours to be alone or join in with beach barbecues, fishing, hiking trips, etc. We often did long stretches without seeing anybody. 
We became super fit and had time for reading and creative pursuits. We had time to live. Self-sufficiency played a part in our lives. Fishing, crabbing, oysters, wild plums, coconuts, nuts, pig-faced plants for salads growing wild, growing our own herbs, and sprouting. We also bartered with other yachties. So many interesting people with everything from the tiniest boats without a motor and refrigeration to luxury yachts. And all such very unique people from all kinds of backgrounds and interests in life. As we reached Cape York, we decided we wanted to continue this way of living, but sail overseas as we were inspired by many yachties who had done it. We made a new plan, sailed south for the summer for cyclone season, and by this time our savings were starting to dwindle. We had been sailing for two years, and I can highly recommend this way of life. We just loved it. And we lived on the cheap. We would need to upgrade boats to do ocean passages. To fund our next boat and get enough money together, we bought a run-down Italian restaurant in Airlie Beach. Another new learning experience. We are back in work mode and working for ourselves. Better than my first job at the bank. 100 Ways to Disappear and Live Free Originally published in 1972 by Eden Press. There are four basic principles of libertarian living, each of which must be observed in order to remain free in America. While libertarians demonstrate a high degree of individual adaptability to the diminishing quality of freedom, it has proven true many times over that none of these principles can be safely violated. For long. The price is harassment, arrest, even confinement. To live free means to be able to control your own life and to avoid violence or the threat of violence by others. What you do will almost always determine whether or not freedom will be yours. But you must take the responsibility for your own freedom. No one, especially the knavish bureaucrats, will do it for you. Here, then, are our four basic principles together with ideas and examples of just how they can best be affected. Principle number one, be inconspicuous. Number one, avoid drawing attention to yourself. Virtually any activity can be interpreted as criminal thanks to the gratuitous profusion of laws. Number two, don't exhibit socially unacceptable behavior publicly. Pigs are programmed to bust anyone who appears suspicious, different from them. And insane asylums, jails, and joints aren't exactly free. Number three, in practice, legality comes to mean much less than outward conventionality, conformity, and thus respectability. Get it? Number four, your appearance, possessions, and actions should always justify your presence on a legitimate conventional basis. This is the best way to avoid suspicion. Number five, if you are stopped and questioned, always be able to give a reasonable explanation of why you are there, where you are from, and where you are going. Smile and be helpful. Number six, a sullen or hostile attitude triggers the cop for a bust, your bust. So go ahead and kill the pigs with kindness. You'll win, brother. Number seven, even perfectly legal behavior can arouse suspicion. Avoid such things as solitary walks late at night. The man finds it easy, even entertaining, to pin stray raps on such suspicious characters. Days and weeks can go by before they decide they've made a mistake. Really. Number eight. Examine your daily habits and eliminate any which might possibly be regarded as peculiar, especially if performed publicly. Number nine. Live in a large city where you can have the protection of anonymity. Avoid the small towns where the only sport is gossip about those people. Your business should be no one else's. Appear to be lower middle class in your standard of living. Don't attract the attention given the very poor or the obviously well off. Number 11. Rent a house or apartment that appears respectable, but no more plush than the average cop can afford. Number 12. If you like to live it up, do it somewhere other than around where you live and work. Mexico and Jamaica are great trips. Number 13. Dress conventionally. Adopt what you perceive as the broad community standard. Don't be black or white, as long as gray has so many shades. Number 14. Be clean and neat, never showy or gaudy. Number 15. Conformity for guys means no beard, long hair, or freaky clothes. Biker threads are out. Number 16. For chicks, no sexy convention flaunting attire such as mini skirts and see-through blouses without underwear. Pigs love to drool over our liberated sisters, and often do more. Number 17. Have conventional answers to common questions. Where you are from, where you work, where your family lives. Number 18. There's less heat in telling plausible lies than encountering with self-righteous silence. The object is to avoid suspicion, so be a reasonable person. Lying is not illegal unless you're under oath or perpetrating a fraud. 
What's more, it's perfectly moral to lie to someone who asks about things which are none of his business. He is the one who is acting immorally. Remember this. Number 20. Be outwardly quiet and unobtrusive around home. 21. Don't keep noisy dogs, excessive cats, or any other pets which might, because of their nature or their number, be of concern to your neighbors or the health departments. 22. Don't throw wild parties. Far too many busts come courtesy of tender-eared, blue-nosed, flink-ass neighbors. Pathetic, but true. 23. Don't make crystal, DMT, acid, or nitro in your kitchen. Window sills are not the best places to cultivate either. 24. Hold your stereo at under 5 decibels late at night. Not everyone mellows out with the stones or the grateful dead. 25. Your neighbors are the most dangerous people you know. Include your relatives here, too. They will all snitch without compunction. Calling the cops is a fair sport in towns of all sizes, so don't antagonize. 26. Be superficially nice to your neighbors, but have as little as possible to do with them. Ideally, you don't want them to know anything about you. 27. Never express controversial opinions around home or at work. If you have to preach, do it in another town or state. 28. Change neighbors at least once a year. Move to a different part of town and don't leave a forwarding address. 29. Allusions to going back east, getting drafted, returning to college, etc. can be helpful smokescreens to evading inquisitive landlords. Never let them know where you're really going. 30. J. Edgar Hoover stated many times that fully 90% of all arrests by the FBI are due directly to the helpful cooperation of neighbors and relatives. Need we say more? 31. Should you have school-aged children and not want them to attend public schools, you can A. Find a suitable private school B. Tell neighbors the children are feeble-minded and that you are tutoring them at home C. Tell the inquisitive you are a transient visitor from Mississippi Virginia or South Carolina, states which have repealed compulsory attendance laws. D. Move every three months or so to prevent rumors from spreading too far. And lastly, E. Keep the children undercover during school hours. 32. Don't take the bus cross country. Terminals are notorious hangouts for pig informers who appraise bus travelers as, quote, only niggers, spicks, college beatniks, and other commie types, end quote. You'd never believe who said this, but then again, you may very well know. 33. Even if you observe all these precautions, you might still be harassed by criminals, both private and public. Whatever you do, don't blow your cover, and thus lead them to suspect you. Keep your temper, be humble and polite, and refrain from shouting matches and or slugfests. Remember, you are a minority of one. They have the guns and the bars. 34. If you're not content, however, to let vengeance be the Lord's, at least abide by this cardinal rule of guerrilla warfare. Don't let the enemy determine your tactics. Retaliate at a time and place with weapons of your choosing. Principle number two, separate and insulate your basic life activities. 35. Keep your home, job, personal trips, and hobbies well separated, even self-contained. Don't let heat in one area endanger any of the others. How? Read on. 36. Keep the address of where you actually live a well-guarded secret. This is very important. 37. Never carry your actual address on you or in your car. 38. Let only those who are trustworthy and have a genuine need know your actual address. 39. Set up a legal address somewhere else, such as a closet at a friend's house containing some misleading personal effects, books on subjects you have no interest in, and clothes a few sizes away from your own, etc. He can thus point to something if ever questioned. Of course, he has the slightest notion of when you'll be back from India. 40. Use this legal address for all your ID which you plan on using regularly, such as driver's license or state ID, provided also for your employer's records should it be required. 41. If you need a phone, use a phony name. Let only the address to be correct among the facts you are asked to provide. A small cash deposit is a small price for anonymity. 42. Rent your pad under even another name if you wish. 43. Pay your rent in cash and never has your name on it. 44. Receive all your mail at a 24-hour post office. Use your legal address to obtain a box or any friendly address for that matter. Peace of mind is not expecting the fascist to knock at 3 in the morning with or without a warrant. 45. Never sign for registered or certified mail. Tell the postman you have moved. He will then return the letter to the post office and send out a notice to come pick it up at the post office. Again, ignore it. 
the registered letter from a greedy bill collector or professional snooper will go back to the sender, unclaimed and undeliverable. You can't be reached. The snooper won't know your address either. 46. Instead of a post office box, you can employ a mail forwarding service. They will cooperate fully in your efforts to keep a good distance between you and anyone else, whatever your reasons. Most newspapers carry their ads in the personal classifieds. With two or more services, you can have your mail routed in and out of the country, each mailing under a different name. Houdini never had it so easy. 47. For people and bill collectors you want to lose, provide a forwarding address out of the country. You can arrange to have letters mailed from foreign countries, stating that you have no intention of ever returning. If they are to creditors, tell them to write you off and save the collection expense. 48. Another ruse for covering tracks is to write deceased on the face of any incoming mail. Drop unopened into public boxes. 49. Any activity which might attract unfavorable attention, such as writing, nude photography, erotic sculpture, etc., should be done under a gnome de plume. Provide a separate address for any such names. Post office boxes are fine. 50. Avoid being fingerprinted. Don't apply for civil service jobs. The FBI would like to have everyone fingerprinted so they can control individual lives. Truly the mark of the beast when you think about it. 51. Stay out of the armed forces. Here, again, fingerprinting labels you forever with the only method of positive identification. 52. Don't apply for security clearances or seek employment in firms which routinely fingerprint. 53. Don't take part in mass demonstrations or dissident activities which might lead to arrests. Fingerprinting would surely follow. 54. The thumbprint requested but not required by California for its driver's license does not go to the FBI. It is used only in cases of suspected identity. Decline to give your print, however, on the grounds that it violates your basic religious beliefs or that it's part of the international communist conspiracy. Look at the bureaucrats straight in the eyes with this one. After a quick paranoid glance over your left shoulder. 55. Keep your name out of public records such as business licenses, permits, tax accounts. Operate under another name or use another person as a front. 56. Always subscribe to magazines and newspapers under a phony name. Pay with money orders. 57. Likewise, always order merchandise by mail under an alias. Just good form, folks. 58. Never order utility services in your real name. Utility companies are the first watering hole for skip tracers. 59. Own real estate under either a cooperative relative's name or a fictitious one. 60. If you have to vote, use your legal address. Just make sure you don't live there. 61. Vehicle registrations, like real estate, are much safer in another name. No heat here so long as the taxes and fees are paid. 62. Try to do without a checking or savings account unless it's set up under a solid alias. This means obtaining a legitimate social security number, and unless you know what you're doing, you are inviting a lot of heat. By far the best methods for creating legal ID are all outlined in careful detail in the paper trip from Eden Press, 595 by mail. With this kind of ID, you can do anything you like under your new name, which you might find difficult or impossible under your old name. A worthy investment indeed. Principle number three, respect the anonymity of other libertarians. 63. Protect the names, addresses, and telephone numbers of fellow libertarians. Use a code of your own making to disguise the actual names and numbers. Keep in a safe place. Try to avoid carrying this coded address book with you. Pigs always flash on such items and so-called rings are busted this way. A smart thing to do would be to carry a dummy book of names and numbers selected at random from the phone book. 65. This practice protects you too and as much as suspicion is cast on you should some of your friends be busted and their names appear in your book. 66. It's also a bummer if your friends get picked up because of your carelessness. They tend not to be friends anymore. 67. Don't engage in illegal activity on other people's property without their express consent. Save the grass and skin scenes for your own home orgy. 68. Don't ask questions which intrude on the privacy of others. Ask general questions, not specific. One might not want you to know where he works, but wouldn't mind telling you his occupation. 69. Adopt the attitude that personal information such as your school background, national origin, interests, politics, family income, etc., etc., are no one's business but your own. And stick to it. Snooping will thereby become so difficult that suspicion will be cast on the snooper rather than on you. 70. 
When faced with such an inquisitive person, have prepared a set of standard answers which you can deliver without discomfort or concern. But if the person is really obnoxious, give him some out-and-out -out lies which, when reported in the right places, will make him look more like the ass he is. 71. Get around creating public records of your financial transactions. As mentioned above, avoid using personal checks. For large amounts, use money orders. Put phony names and addresses on them, or write illegibly. If you are mailing the money order, include a note which gives the correct information. 72. Don't request receipts unless the amount is large. Make them intelligible only to the parties involved. Remember, cash still has no names on it, which is why Big Brother can hardly wait for the day of the cashless society. Caution. Most banks have well-established policies for recording serial numbers of large denomination bills whenever they are deposited or withdrawn in large amounts. 73. Payment of taxes of all kinds should be largely a matter of personal convictions. The debate among libertarians alone is endless, so only a few generally observed practices will be mentioned here. 74. The basic rule in which even the IRS concurs is pay only what you are liable for. This means taking advantage of any and all loopholes to the fullest with the ultimate aim of paying no tax whatsoever. Remember, too, however, that several federal joints have rather distinguished populations of tax-evading accountants, attorneys, businessmen, and politicians. If avoiding personal income tax is your goal, both state and federal, by all means, study well or seek competent advice. 75. Sales and use taxes can often be avoided by buying consumer items through personal channels such as friends, bazaars, swap meets, classified want ads, bartering, and business exchanges. Out-of-state mail order purchases are exempt from local taxes. 76. Selective non-payment of taxes, such as refusing to pay that portion of your tax which would ordinarily go for unacceptable social purposes, like war, foreign military aid, CIA, big industry subsidies, narcs, FBI spies, ad nauseum, has become increasingly acceptable and feasible thanks to the rise of numerous organizations which have established recognized trust funds with your otherwise tax dollars. This field is wide open as the courts have done virtually nothing due to the endless complications of class action, non-payment tax cases. 77. Sharp practices, such as claiming 10 or 12 dependents to reduce the weekly bite of withholding, or making a deal with your employer to be paid in cash, which a great many do willingly, are ways of lessening, even eliminating your tax, but can't be recommended if you plan on remaining in the same job for over a year or so, or if you don't wish to live with a solid alias. 78. A compromise in the above dilemma is to maintain a minimal tax profile, but plan on earning the bulk of your income through non-recorded means, say odd jobs for cash. Lead a straight life for the tax vultures, but live underground with another trade and or name. Number 79. In seeking employment, you are usually asked for former job references. If you know that some of them will be negative, don't list them. For the resulting gaps in your employment history have already made up the names and addresses of your former employers. They could be local or out of state, in which case they probably won't be verified except by mail. Of course, you'll be prepared for this by listing a mail forward service's address as that of your former employer. Merely pay the first month's fee and notify the service of your code name, a company. You will then be able to rewrite your own employment history. Oh, happy day! Gaps can also be covered by using attendance at school or travel abroad as alternatives to negative job references. 80. For local job references, a good trick is to ask or pay a businessman's secretary to give all the goody information right over the telephone. Provide the phone number on the application, naturally, but remember that the number may very well be verified first by a call to information. When it checks out, your application will appear quite honest, won't it? 81. Personal references on either employment or credit applications are a laugh. They are virtually never verified. Provide them, of course, but feel no compunction whatever in lifting random names and assumed relationships right from the phone book. A locally known doctor or minister is a safe bet, too. 82. For credit references, bear in mind that outfits like big department stores and most credit unions will not give out information to anyone on one of their customers' or members' accounts. This means you can use any number of these references with impunity when applying for credit, as the lender will not be able to verify one way or the other if your application is true, a fact he will definitely not tell you. A complete guide, by the way, to establishing and obtaining credit and credit cards is included in the paper trip. Principle 4. Create an alternative identity. 83. A solid set of ID in another name is what can truly be called freedom insurance. With the growing threat of arrest and prosecution for leading a free life, it's plainly comforting to have the option to cut and run, even if you choose not to. 84. Obtaining alternate IDs should be done before you get into trouble. Take the time to do it right. In an emergency, many other matters will compete for your time. 
In the future, first-class ID may become more difficult to obtain, too. 85. The best ID to obtain is obviously that which is issued directly by government agencies themselves. Using forged, stolen, or totally fake ID is a bust in itself. Needless to say, a number of mail-order firms do offer ID cards and blanks for sale, but the chances of your being able to lead an undetected alternate life with such phony papers are slim indeed. They can get you into a bar, but they won't get you a passport. 86. With legal ID, you will find no trouble in doing many tasks which would otherwise prove impossible or extremely difficult at best. Also, with legal ID, the risk of detection is reduced to a minimum when and if you choose to disappear. 87. With government ID, you can effectively erase the curse of a jail or prison record. Tens of thousands of free Americans carry with them the permanent label of felon or ex-con. The real crime begins only after a person leaves the joint. Legal and social ostracism continue all their lives. What better reason to disappear? 88. If you had the misfortune to receive a less than honorable discharge from the armed forces, thousands do so annually, the acquisition and use of an alternate identity will be your first step in beginning to live free. You've already lost most, if not all, your GI benefits, but at least you'll be able to get a decent job. Now, watch out for fingerprinting, however. Big Brother has your prints and will be only too happy to prove you're one of those dirty, rotten, commie rat flink deserters. And you thought honest criminals had it bad. 89. Using a legal identity is another way of covering up a bad employment record, too, particularly if the law was involved in some adverse way, theft, embezzlement, etc. In some occupational circles, the word gets around. Fast. 90. Men of draft age have used an alternate ID to escape what they consider the illegal obligation of fighting in a moral war. They've gone to Canada and later come back as someone else. 91. By obtaining the required documents, you can even change citizenship. People like James Earl Ray and Clifford Irvings could have covered their tracks permanently had they only known a few basics of alternate ID. 92. Many have made a regular practice of beating creditors and collection agencies through the adroit use of aliases and legal alternate ID. They are living proof that debts belong to yesterday. Financially, they live quite free today. 93. A quick way up the occupational ladder is to combine mail order school diplomas, certificates, and degrees with expert ID. Not only can a clean break with the past be affected, but a sharp increase in income as well. The only limit here is your imagination and desire. 94. Some of the sharpest operators create an ID as a physician or clergyman and rake in commercial discounts as well as hundreds of free offers and special deals once their names get on preferred mailing lists. Such ID can be of great benefit socially, too. 95. Alternate ID is the quickest way to starting all over in the credit world. The most atrocious credit record is gone forever when your old name disappears. This is an oversimplification, certainly, but what else can you say when you aren't you anymore? 96. Once some form of commercial credit is established, the obtaining of bank credit cards, oil company cards, and travel and entertainment cards is almost automatic if a few solid rules are observed. These are all detailed in the paper trip. 97. Related to alternate ID are the uses of handwriting, physical disguises, and cosmetology as they underline and support the believability of a new person. The paper trip covers all these subjects as well. 98. The ultimate technique and the most basic necessity for initiating the creation of legal alternate identity is obtaining a very special type of birth certificate directly from the government itself. Until now, only the cleverest of international espionage agents have known and used this method, but now, the details are analyzed in full in the paper trip. This method so far surpasses any other in effectiveness, as to make anything less an absolute waste of time, to say nothing of your peace of mind. 99. From this unique method flow all the beauties of obtaining any other ID you need directly from the government, too. Paper Trip spells out a step-by-step -step sequence for acquiring a complete package of freedom-giving alternate ID, from driver's licenses to passports. Whatever you need, it's there, completely described and explained. 100. Finally, to assure your successful disappearance and continued ability to live free, you owe it to yourself to purchase the Paper Trip. While this has been but a brief attempt to introduce you to the concept of living free, Paper Trip is a master guide and unequaled source of underground information for actually doing so. Do it today. Now. You've just heard 100 Ways to Disappear and Live Free, originally published in Eden Press in 1972. Winter in the Woods by WJP, originally published in Vanu Life, March 1973. My love for the Vanu way of life has its origins back in Boy Scouts. 
I was very lucky in having a unit with leaders that were as much stoked on getting out in the wilderness as they were on the usual merit badge competition crap. I never liked the hiking, but getting there made it all worth it. Most of my education came on those hikes and with friends later as we continued the tradition. As so many have found, you can't live a city life or even a farm life and then suddenly decide to go Vanua immediately. Lessons must be lived and learned. It took me a year in Vietnam to learn the value of my legs. The summer after I got out, I got together with an old friend and a couple we knew, and we set up a small camp near Butte Meadows, about 40 miles from Chico, California, on land owned by Diamond International, a lumber company. We spent several weekends scouting out a spot that would, one, supply running water nearby, two, be open enough to let the sun in but be forested all around, and three, be as isolated as possible from the dirt roads nearby. We settled on a tiny meadow near a creek, accessible to the truck and VW we would use to bring in supplies, and yet far enough from the dirt roads to allow fair security from detection. We built a sweat lodge out of willows covered with a tarp and dirt, and even dammed up part of the creek to swim in. We ate mostly government food commodities, and had a small wood stove to cook in. We drank fresh creek water. There was nothing between us and these several feeder springs but a few miles of 20-year-ago logged forest and unraped meadows, as we soon learned on extended walks. After two months, we were discovered. It seems that Diamond International employs a duffer to patrol their land in a Toyota Jeep and run off any intruders. He said he had been by many times, but this time, soon after a shower, he noticed tire tracks leaving the main dirt road and decided to follow them. He couldn't believe his eyes, said it was the cleanest camp he'd ever seen, said he'd like to let us stay, but that he couldn't because of his job, gave us a few days to be gone. I got permission to live on private land near there, and we put up a small shack out of lumber we scrounged from old deserted cabins in the area. Most of the wood was sawmill oak, which had been cut right in that area over 50 years ago. We roofed it with old corrugated tin found also on old shacks. The next summer, after a city winter, I spent at the shack. People would come up and visit, sometimes for days, and I did a lot of walking and reading and looking at stars and thinking. Ah, uh, the hunters came without warning and scared the piss out of me at first, but soon I realized that the deer and I stood a better chance with them than the bobcats, mountain lions, etc., so I just sat in my shack and waited for them to get it out of their systems for one more year. After the second weekend of the last season, I heard, I heard an area shot. I spent the winter, last winter there, doing a bit of reading and writing and a lot of wood chopping. This was when I learned of the growing sport of snowmobiling. They never came up to my place, but the noise could be heard of for over a mile. It was disturbing at first, but it soon got to be a trip to sit outside and watch them zoom along, staying mostly on the roads, making all kinds of powerful sounds, going nowhere, just going asserting their existence. They only came on the sunny weekends and once at a time that must have been semester break for the college town in Chico. I never bothered them and they never really bothered me. We were just finding different answers to the same questions. We all have such a fear of spending time alone and especially away from where we can get help fast. I tried not to scare myself and knew that if I could just get up there, snowed in with the essentials, that I would make it. What really did it was that, because of my experiences in Nam, I was no longer afraid to die or afraid to let go of the known. Surely I did not want to die. I did all the research I could to make me more prepared for the winter, but I was not caught up with fear like some of my friends. When they heard what I was planning, all they could say was, what if this and what if that? They couldn't see that maybe a special experience is worth the uncertainty it entails. I got my water from the creek, my wood from down timber, and my light from kerosene lamps. I ground my flour on a corona mill. I had two squirrels, a gopher, a few mice, three raccoons, and several coyotes for neighbors. I found I didn't need shit food and sugar and movies and TV and cars and steaks and new clothes and lots of money and a successful career and weekly sex and grass and booze and mescaline and acid and flush toilets and electricity and hot showers after all. But if I hadn't had them, I probably wouldn't know that I didn't need them. It was a short, warm winter, only lasting a little over three months at 4,000 feet, and it was a glorious spring. I saw so much more of life because I was really looking now and not blindly caught up in keeping busy. I got an unskilled job pretty easily and worked this summer, getting my overdue dental work done. I had cracked two teeth eating raw wheat kernels, but had only three small cavities, and preparing for this winter. I had permission to keep an eye on a Boy Scout camp near my shack. The lodge was broken into and ransacked last winter by snowmobilers, I presume. My main staples will be wheat and brown rice with some dried vegetables, flavored soy protein, and a little meat as supplements. I got along nicely with very little meat in the last two years and plan to continue. 
Here, as anywhere, you have to get out and scout around and do what you have to do in order to find out what it is you really want to do. Peace to you and yours. Hi to Rayo and Dr. G. Until next spring, WJP. Letter from Rayo, February 1970. Lumping in self-liberation with retreating seems to be a common error, caused no doubt by superficial similarities of techniques. While I hold that a fully liberated lifestyle must be able to cope with any likely emergency situation, and that a disaster of one kind or another is very probable sometime within the next 30 years, I don't think that the primary objective of present living is to prepare for a disaster. For more on this, see L. Ray's remarks in Autumn 69 Innovator. Most important, I reject the present and future dichotomy of retreatists, that they will continue servile living until conditions get much worse, and then, presumably, move permanently to their log cabin and watch society obligingly collapse on schedule. I have never maintained that motorized nomadism is a panacea. I did choose it for and have found it to be an excellent interim lifestyle for someone still extensively involved in the servile society through earning money, seeking a woman, etc. I have always considered dependence on state-controlled highways and gasoline to be a major shortcoming and a compromise I intend to rectify, which brings me to the main subject. After much study and evaluation, my freemate and I have largely decided on a mix of troglodism, underground, and pedestrian nomadism as a fully liberated, no compromises, lifestyle, into which we will evolve. Since nomadism and troglodism integrate nicely, this will be a gradual process. We will retain our camper indefinitely, but as an accessory, secondary mobile home, to be sold or parked permanently if or when highway controls become appreciably worse. For location, we are considering areas from Southern California and Northern California to interior British Columbia. One factor affecting location choice is access to other potential free men. For personal self-satisfaction, we want to help build viable libertarian mini-cultures. If liberation never gets beyond a handful of recluses hiding here and there, and libertarian philosophy died as they die, I will be disappointed. And with less capability for long-range migration and increasing unreliability and restrictions of state postal, location will be increasingly important. Our move towards pedestrian nomadism slash troglodism is prompted in part by a feeling that we are not really free so long as we depend to any degree on legal interstices, including the state not yet being as bad as the state could easily become. I want a lifestyle which can easily withstand the worst technocratic super-totalitarianism that is within the realm of reasonable possibility. We may still have some contact with that society, but we won't have to worry appreciably over what idiotic thing the people molesters do next, any more than somebody who takes a vacation at the Riviera now and then needs to be much concerned about the politics of France. Our change in lifestyle will be, in a sense, an answer to the omnipotence of state line of Rothbard and Hess. We will answer not in words, but by doing, the only real way. Letter from Rayo, March 1970 I strongly disagree that retreatism offers more security. Most multi-fortresses never get out of the dreaming stage because of the present and future dichotomy implicit in retreatism, Somehow, most retreatists never have enough money and time left from living it up in the present. But, assuming a retreatist does carry through and build his fortress, he still faces the prospects of long-distance travel under hazardous conditions, and he will be making formidable changes in living conditions precisely when there is no time for further learning and little margin for errors. And if, instead of an apocalypse, there is only an almost imperceptible deterioration. He will probably never bring himself to move. He will only bitch, as usual, and adjust. But I can't be very down on retreatism. Many retreatists graduate to self-liberation. For several years before opting out, I carried food supplies around in the trunk of my car, explored retreat sites, etc. What finally prompted my move was not society getting worse, but my own head getting better disentangled from status and statist games, more and better ideas on how to liberate myself. Once a super-retreatist has a fortress or two, 
Is it rational for him to keep living in some city apartment, earning still more money to build still more vacant fortresses? For the cost of several years of middle-class existence, he can equip and fortress with almost every facility and comfort he and his harem could want. Machine shop, liquid nitrogen temperature deep freeze, huge book, record, film library, secret communication links to other fortresses, and urban contacts, etc. The person who expects to do nothing until there is an emergency, on the supposition that he can then get help from self-liberators or serious retreatists, had best have something to trade besides bullshit, and most of them won't, I suspect. We spend less time, and most equivalent, on repetitive and uninteresting biological requirements, obtaining, preparing food and shelter, etc., than do conventional dwellers, more time on certain tasks, but less overall. But genuine biological necessities don't consume much time anyhow. The big drains in the servile society are the status games, biological luxuries which become psychological and often political necessities. Even most traditional primitive people spend more time on status games than biological necessities, often with fatal results. Well, it might seem that one could live conventionally and yet avoid status games, this is seldom possible. The games are too interwoven with conventional society. Even if one is not incarcerated for peculiar behavior or fired from job after job for antisocial attitudes, he incurs crushing psychological burdens, spending most of his life in contact with people and media hostile to his values. A degree of physical separation seems to be essential for liberation, as well as for long-term mental health. Certainly, it may be wise to play sheep on occasion, but those not of sheep mentality will be freer, happier, healthier, in a lifestyle where such occasions are few and far between. All right, and there you have it, the Liberated Lifestyle Chronicles. Uh, I do hope you've enjoyed these special episodes uh, here on Coast Coast AM, and uh, I do invite you uh, to join us on a more permanent basis over at vanupodcast.com. Uh, that is the home for everything Vanu and everything self-liberation. Again, vanupodcast.com. And as I said earlier on, you can also just search for the Vanu Podcast on your favorite podcatcher. Uh, thanks so much for your time. Uh, I wish you all a wonderful year of liberation, uh, despite the nonsense and sanity transpiring in the Serval Society. Uh, always remember, Vanu is yours for the making, and the second realm is yours for the building. Cheers. Vanu means relative physical and vulnerability to coercion. Vanu is a contraction of voluntary and not vulnerable. Vanu is somewhat like freedom or security, but those words mean many different things to different people. Rather than argue about what those words ought to mean, I speak of Vanu. Coercion includes murder, mayhem, slavery, robbery, rape, extortion, pollution. Any physical interference with peaceful activities of another, whether by individuals or organizations. Coercion, especially institutionalized forms such as war, regimentations, and taxes, is one of the major problems of mankind. Practically all past attempts at solution have been top-down efforts to change society as a whole. Since the days of Babylon, there have been countless attempts to reform governments, take over governments, destroy governments, and manipulate public opinion. At most, such efforts bring temporary relief. Usually they have little effect. Often, they make matters worse. Vanu life represents a different approach to the problem. Vanu life does not waste space scolding government officials or proclaiming how society ought to be. Vanu life speaks to you as an individual or small group and suggests ways you can avoid exploiting and being exploited. As you reduce the vulnerability, not only do you help yourself, indirectly you also help others by decreasing support of criminal institutions. Vanu is not necessarily only a few. Vanu will expand as there are more people willing to do. A Vanuan is a person who has achieved relative invulnerability to coercion. There are many kinds. Some live in the wilderness, where outsiders rarely go. Others live under the earth. Others move from place to place, living in vans, campers, buses, boats, or tents. Some have been Vanu for ages, people such as gypsies, mountain men, hobos, seminoles. Others are recent refugees from the dying cities. This issue describes some of the equipment and techniques used. In future issues, I hope you'll add your knowledge to what is in here. Vanu life. How to live and let live. 
out of sight and minds of those unwilling to let live by people who are doing it. To order your paperback copy today, just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu Life. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu Life. Or to download this publication for free, visit vanupodcast.com forward slash VL.